Uh, yeah, thank you, Leonardo, and thanks so much for inviting me here. So this is a this is a new project that I haven't uh, gotten a chance to talk about anywhere yet, and I'm really excited to talk about it uh, to this audience in particular. Um, so this is a project that's very much like a combinatorics uh, in search of some algebra project, and uh, I think we've found the algebra now. So I mean, I'm very excited about this. It, it's a contextualizing uh, some things that I've been wondering about for like almost a decade now. And uh, I think we found the correct algebra to go with it, but we haven't really pushed very hard into exploring that story. And so uh, I hope to convince you that you should do that. And like, if you believe, if you believe in combinatorics the way that uh, I do, and my co-authors, uh, Becky and Jessica, if you believe in combinatorics, that's telling you this is very uh, nice, interesting algebra to look at. And, uh, you know, and this is a very diverse audience. Maybe people don't believe in combinatorics as much as I do, but uh, I hope to convince you that this is interesting algebra that you should think about, and then you should tell me all about it. Oh, now my slides won't go. Come on, slides. There we go. So this is going to be a talk about uh, spec modules, really. So uh, spec modules are the irreps for the symmetric group. Uh, they're labeled by uh, partitions of n, so ways of writing n as a sum of uh, some non-decrease, non-increasing sequence of positive integers. Okay, so uh, it's easy to see that such objects correspond to conjugacy classes inside the symmetric group. So the character theory is telling you that that's the right number of irreps. But there are like really uh, nice ways to label you know, canonically label your irreducible representations by these partitions, and we'll sort of see some piece of that uh, coming up. And, and so the why, why am I uh, doing this a Schubert calculus uh, seminar, uh, like just spec modules, but I want to think about things not just like, not just the like isomorphism class of this module, but I want to like realize it very concretely like it's going to be made up of uh, like explicit elements and the elements are just going to be like global sections of some line bundle on some partial flag variety. And like, depending on your Lambda, you have like some choice and like which flag variety you're thinking about. And so we're gonna do this all like very explicitly. And so the point is for me, like there's many ways to build up, uh, to build a spec module, to build some irreducible representation. And when you do this, you don't just get, uh, you don't just get like uh, the module. Like every time you're building this construction, it the, the construction gives you a basis, right? You end up with this distinguished basis, and maybe algebraically you don't really care about that so much, but combinatorially you do very much care about the basis that comes with your object. And it's not canonical. Like different ways of building a spec module are going to give you different bases, and and combinatorics, of course, we spend a lot of time uh, looking at our distinguished bases, thinking about how to change basis between things. And this gets you into some like deep material, like uh, you know, Kajdan Lustig polynomials are essentially telling you like how to how to change basis for a spec module. So we're gonna like think about this as a object with with a basis stuck onto it. Okay, so I'm not gonna think about all spec modules today. I'm going to think about uh, some uh, non-obvious uh, two-parameter family of spec modules uh, coming from shapes that look like this. So, so there's some number uh, k. So we have two rows of size k, and then we have uh, that stuck on a flagpole of height l. And, and these are the things we're looking at. Um, maybe not the family you would first think to write down, but I hope to convince you that this is a really nice, interesting family of things to look at. Maybe the first, uh, I don't know, the first, the first place that these were sort of isolated, these partitions at least, were like looked at as a thing. Uh, there's some work of Richard Stanley from the mid 90s, uh, based on observations of Kathy O'Hara and Andrzej Zelovinsky, uh, looking at this particular set of partitions. And it's all purely enumerative at that point. Right? They're just uh, ejecting some things with some other things, noticing some numerology. But I don't know, it's been hints for a while that these are special shapes somehow. So, uh, you know, we've been calling these flag shaped partitions for a while because it looks like a flag. You have this thing and it's stuck on a flagpole. 
Um, but now with all the flag varieties floating around, that seems like a poor choice of names. And so uh, they're going to be pennants, right? They're particularly long, skinny flags on flagpoles. Here we go. This was the like only picture I could find online of something that actually had the flagpole attached. So it has to be preschool, apparently. Okay, so let's think about uh, what's going on here. So let's think about first the case L equals zero. So L equals zero, we have no flagpole. I'm just thinking about uh, two by N rectangles. And in this case, there's something really nice and like well understood. Uh, you get a basis of your spec module coming out of coming out of like temporary lieb ideas, and it fits into uh, Cooperberg's story of webs. Uh, it's exactly like what you would get for the webs associated to uh, the algebra SL2. So you're getting these uh, this diagrammatic basis that's labeled by you know things that look like this, these sort of uh, non-crossing matching diagrams I have. Uh, and points around my circle, and I'm pairing them up in some way uh, such that all of the lines don't, they pairwise don't intersect. And so something really nice going on there. And uh, we're going to let our partition have a flagpole. It's going to become the L be bigger than zero. And you're going to get a corresponding basis of objects that look like this. So we've, we've taken uh, what was a partition of our n things into pairs. And now we're partitioning the blocks that are potentially bigger than size 2. So we're looking at non-crossing set partitions uh, that have no singleton blocks inside them. So it's, you're looking at, uh, you know, you're taking n things and you're breaking them into pieces such that the convex hulls are pairwise non-intersecting. And this might look like some sort of funny combinatorial accident, but I, I claim it. there's more to it than that. Um, like there's an SL3 version of this story where uh, I won't get too deeply into this, but you're looking at you know these sorts of things. Uh, there's some kind of planar bipartite uh, trivalent graph here, uh, giving you a basis element, and and I claim that there's a, a corresponding story that's sort of a marriage of the SL3 web story and the pennant story. You get you get pictures like this. Uh, it's some kind of planar uh, hypergraph that is bipartite in some sense and uh, trivalent in some sense and elliptic in some sense. And they're, they're giving you something very analogous. So this is a sort of ongoing combinatorial work in progress to understand the story, but I claim it's very nice. And so this is not like some one-off accident, this, uh, this pennant case here, but there really is something interesting going on. Um, the, the history of sort of how we got into this is we were, you know, we're thinking, uh, we're, we're motivated by some combinatorics problems. We're motivated by these dynamic algebraic combinatorics issues. So we're thinking of some sort of action on Tableau, trying to understand dynamics of, of actions on Tableau. And uh, these, these should be the tools that you use to do that. And somehow like we understand kind of the main line of the argument there, but, uh, we're getting stuck in some places. And so we thought we should go back to uh, this pennant case where we understand the combinatorics and uh, we should figure out the algebra and get some more tools so that we can return to these cases and uh, with some extra power. Okay, so I'm not gonna actually tell you like what the Tableau dynamics are because most people here probably don't uh, particularly care about these applications, but I think like webs are something that people here should care about. Uh, and maybe you do care about them. And if you don't care about them, you probably should be caring about them. They, they do all sorts of great things. So they're not just you know, telling you about spec modules, but there's like the, there's a quantum group floating around here. Uh, and, and from that, you're getting quantum link invariant. So from in this SL2 case, right, this is giving rise to the Jones polynomial. And the point is that uh, you know if you look at a link diagram and you you zoom in on your link diagram, uh, a little neighborhood of it is going to look uh, basically like a matching, and that's so you can use the sort of diagrammatics to uh, expand that and obtain obtain invariance. 
And you can do something analogous over here in the SL3 case. I'm not really sure uh, what to call it, but you get something, some kind of Cooperberg invariant. Here is some kind of SL3 quantum link invariant. And so you could sort of hope to do something. Uh, I'm telling you, I have these things that are basically webs. And so you should try to do analogous things in these other places. It, it, they're also, you know, webs are doing nice things on the geometry of Springer fibers. Like uh, Springer fibers in general, like they're associated to some uh, Jordan type and they're hard to understand uh, really what they look like. But in these like special Jordan types where you have uh, corresponding webs, uh, you can make things very explicit. You can understand like uh, really how the various irreducible components uh, interact with each other. And there's also like really nice cluster algebra stories associated to all these webs. So, so you should care about webs. Now I'm giving you some things that are uh, very much like webs. Okay. So let's let's talk about uh, this story some more um, as a as a sort of warm up um, to tell you what's going on there. And uh, then we will take our break after we do that. And then we will see how to add a flag pull on the things and, and get this pennant story over here. Okay. So let's think about that case. Let's see where this is all coming from. So I want to think about a polynomial ring in 2n variables. And I want to look at the polynomials that are invariant under SL2. So the way I'm thinking about this is that I'm arranging my variables as a two by n matrix, or this two by n matrix of, of distinct indeterminants. And uh, I'm just letting SL2 act by left multiplication here. So it, it does some things to my entries of this matrix. And I'm interested in polynomials that are like unaffected by this multiplication. And if you think about this a little bit, it's not so hard to see some invariant polynomials. For example, if I look at this two by two minor, uh, that's going to be the same as this two by two minor. Right? That's just something you can compute explicitly. And, and it's not just like that one. Like all the two by two minors of this matrix are unaffected by acting by SL two on this thing. Okay, so. Uh, Here's a very old theorem, not really sure who to attribute anything to. But in fact, this is essentially everything. With this ring of invariance is generated algebraically by the two by two minors. There's nothing else sitting inside there. They're not uh, you know, linearly independent or anything. They have relations, but uh, they are a generating set. And if I, if I proj this uh, invariant ring, uh, well, I'm just getting my Grassmannian. This is giving me my Grassmannian of two planes in n space, okay, which is a thing I like very much. And so these minors, these minors are turning into uh, my Plucker variables. This is not usually how people tell you know, the story of the Plucker embedding, but uh, so normally you're thinking of uh, what's going on here is you have your homogeneous coordinate ring is going to be uh, some quotient. Okay, I'm taking a polynomial ring in my Plucker variables, modulo some relations, modulo the Plucker relations. And what I've done here is I've set everything up as a subring of something else. The point is that there are relations among these two by two minors, and, and those relations are just exactly the, the Plucker relations that, that you would have anyway. Right, and the point of doing things this way is that uh, now I'm not dealing with equivalence classes. Like I really have a literal polynomial associated to uh, everything. Okay, so we said that we're spanned by products of two by two minors, products of Plucker, so Plucker monomials. So I wanna think about how can I write down such a Plucker monomial? Right? How do I write down a product of two by two minors? Well, I just need to tell you which minors you're using to tell you a two by two minor of a two row matrix, I just need to tell you which columns you're thinking about. And so uh, I could just write down uh, a two row array where in every column of my array, I'm going to tell you which two columns of the matrix to think about. Okay, so the columns here are not the columns before. 
So like if I have this, uh, this two five column here, that's telling me, uh, you know, you should think about this, this minor, a minor that uses the second column and the fifth column of your matrix of variables. And so you, you know, you uh, take these seven columns, they tell you to take seven minors and multiply them together. And this is some uh, sevenfold product of Flickr variables. And we can like, you know, organize this, this uh, array a little bit, right? We might as well arrange so that all of the columns are, are increasing, right? Why not? We can certainly sort of write them however we want. So these are, these are you know, greater than signs, not wedges. Um, and it doesn't matter, like, uh, you know, multiplication is commutative. So I, I can reorder my columns wherever I want. So I might as well like arrange for my first row here to be a uh, weekly increase. I can just like sort the columns in some way. But the second row, I have basically no control over. The second row is just, you know, whatever it is. It has no nice conditions on it. So uh, every one of these Plucker monomials, I can encode by like some kind of array like this. I sort of try to make it look nice, but the second row looks like kind of a mess. But it's a way of like writing down things. And I know that uh, if I write down all these things and that spans my invariant space, there's an alternative way I could try to, you know, tell you which Plucker monomial I'm thinking about, which is uh, if I'm telling you uh, a two by two minor, I'm telling you a pair of columns. Uh, why don't I just take, if I have eight columns, why don't I just put eight dots around a circle? And uh, whenever I'm thinking about the ij Flickr coordinate, let me just uh, draw an edge from i to j. And so this picture here is encoding the same thing as this array up here. Uh, here is my two five edge. It's just uh, telling me to think about the, the column two, column five minor. Yeah, so I have these two different sort of, I have this sort of, uh, I don't know, this one's easier to type and this one's sort of easier to uh, think about visually. So maybe the, like, the, the key thing of standard monomial theory is to say, well, I have these uh, products, these Plucker monomials that span my space, uh, but they're not linearly independent. I would like to actually have a basis. And so if I look at uh, m-fold products of Plucker variables, uh, this is spanning some finite dimensional space. Like what is the dimension of that space? Which, which one should I look at to have a basis? And the answer turns out to be to look at all these arrays that we wrote down before. And in general, the second row was a complete mess, but let's just restrict attention to the ones where the second row happens to also be weakly increasing, just like the first row was. And uh, it turns out that these are, are linearly independent of each other, and they, uh, they're also spanning. So they're actually a basis for this thing. And then you know the dimension of everything because there's some kind of combinatorial formula for counting these tableau. These are called semi-standard tableau. And, and you have some formula for counting them and you know, you know the dimension of this guy. Okay. So that's uh, not quite what I want to do. I want to, uh, well, first of all, I need an SN action somewhere. And then I want to like find my spec module inside this story. And so, what we want to notice is that there is also an action here uh, of a rank n torus. So I have invertible diagonal matrices uh, right multiplying my matrix, and they're just scaling the columns of my matrix. So I can look at uh, you know a weight space. Let me look at the all ones weight space. So this means I am going to look at products of two by two minors where my two by two minors involve every column of this matrix exactly once. So every column is gonna show up in one of my minors and only one minor. Well, if I look at that piece, that piece uh, as a set, it's preserved by permuting the columns. I have this right action uh, of the symmetric group, my symmetric group acting by multiplication on the right, it's permuting the columns here. And uh, it preserves this space of invariance. And uh, it's not just like 
So it's an SN module. It's not just any SN module. It happens to be uh, irreducible, and it happens to be uh, the spec module that you maybe would have hoped that it would be. It is uh, the one for the two-row rectangular shape, that uh, MM. So this is uh, not, I think, how people usually teach about spec modules, but I think it is like the best way to think about what they are. Like uh, somehow it's very concrete. The elements of this are like some very explicit polynomials that you can literally write down. And there's no equivalent classes of anything going on here. So there's a basis here. So if I'm looking at products of two by two minors where I touch every column exactly once, that means that in my corresponding semi-standard tableau, I should be writing down every number between one and n exactly once. So I'm looking at semi-standard tableau of shape MM, uh, where I have bijectively filled the cells with the numbers one through n, n equals two m. Um, so these are these are called standard young tableau, and uh, of course we also know how to count these. And very famously, these are the special case. There's Catalan many of them. So I'm looking at some Catalan dimensional spec module in this setting. And so, and they have a very explicit basis for it, right? I look at this uh, tableau here and it says, uh, first take the column, columns one and four and take that two by two minor, then take the columns two and five and take that two by two minor, take the three and seven columns, look at that minor, take the six and eight columns, write down that minor, nine and 10 columns, and then just take these five two by two minors and multiply them together. And there's one of my basis elements. You can literally just write it down. You can, your linear algebra 101 students can write down this polynomial. There's nothing hard about it. So uh, I would like to understand the action of the symmetric group on this thing. And in particular, for whatever reason, I'm interested in uh, this long cycle. Okay, it's, well, it's one of the sort of the simplest permutations you could think about. Okay, it's a Coxeter element and sort of maybe the easiest Coxeter element to write down, except for the inverse of it. And let's think about how this acts uh, on my module. And in particular, let's think about how it acts on my module with respect to uh, the basis that appeared out of standard monomial theory. Well. What it's doing, what I'm doing is I'm permuting my columns. So in this case, I'm cyclically shuffling my columns around. It's coming from some like cyclic shift map on a Grassmannian. And uh, so what does that do? Uh, if to the basis element, my basis element looks like uh, one of these tableau, and now I'm re-indexing the columns. So all I need to do is puff all the numbers up by one, uh, except the number 10 is going to turn into a one. So I'm going to get this thing, but that's not really the right kind of thing because I like I didn't use do my conventions properly. Uh, I should take this column and I should you know reorder it to have the one on top. I should go one ten instead of ten one, and then uh, I should sort my columns then so that uh, the one ten column goes to the front. So I'm going to end up with this, but this is not standard. Right? Uh, my second row. Uh, is no longer increasing. So uh, I took my basis element and I hit it with this cyclic shift map and I ended up with some like other product of pluckers that was not a basis element. And so I'm supposed to use the plucker relations to rewrite this in terms of uh, things that are actually standard. Like just keep doing these plucker relations. I think of these as straightening laws for uh, writing this as some sum of standard tableau. Uh, and you're going to get a whole bunch of stuff. You're going to get all sorts of things, and uh, it's sort of not obvious what they're going to be, and it's kind of terrible. Right? Somehow, like uh, we took like the easiest of permutations to think about, and we let it act on a basis element, and we ended up with something kind of horrifying. And uh, it's sort of telling us that maybe uh, we should be thinking about a different basis for this world. So. Uh, I would like to find a Sorry, better can basis. I ask a question. So yeah. The first step is supposed to be easy. Which step? From the, from the first tableau to the second tableau. This one? Yeah. Yeah. I just take my tableau. Uh, so I'm 
Okay, I'm uh, cheating a little bit. There's some signs that I'm glossing over. Okay, there's like a minus one to the something that I'm ignoring. But basically all I want to do is I want to take these numbers and I want to permute these numbers according to my permutation. And I'm going to get something that's like a tableau, except that it satisfies no increasing those conditions anywhere. And then pattern recognition just doesn't tell me how to get from one to the other, even if I think about a cycle. What's that? I say based my, my pattern recognition doesn't tell me how to get from the left one to the middle one, even if I think about a cycle permutation. So all I do is I have this permutation W. And so I'm just going to say this is two, and this is going to become W of two. Ah, okay. All I'm doing oh, is yes. I take okay, these okay, numbers thanks. here and I feed them into the permutation, and I get some, you know, uh, some array of numbers here that is like not not uh, the sort of thing you like to call a tableau. And then you like uh, do some stuff to make it look great, and there's some signs that get introduced. And then you apply the straightening laws over and over again uh, until something falls out. And you get this big linear combination of things that actually look correct. Right? But like, you don't want to do this, right? You're trying to understand the action of this like, very simple element. And uh, so you had to do a lot of work. And so what we want to do is find a basis where uh, you know, the long cycle is going to act in a way we can understand uh, with our with our own brands, okay, and this is one place that webs come in. So if I'm thinking about this spect module, um, what we learned before is that it was going to be spanned by products of pluckers corresponding to matchings. So I take the numbers one through n and I put them around a disk, and uh, I match them up in some way. And then for every edge of that matching, that tells me some plucker. Right? I have this i, j edge that tells me think about the two by two minor that is columns i, column j. Okay, so most of these are going to have you know, things like this. They're going to be like lots of edges all crossing each other everywhere. Uh, just like before, most of our tableau uh, were a disaster in the second row. But it turns out that if you restrict to those particular matchings where none of the lines cross each other, if you look at these non-crossing matchings, uh, those are linear independent and there's the right number of them and they're a basis of the space. So you get this other basis and it's a better basis in, in some sense. Uh, one, one way in which it's better is if I wanna understand what does my long cycle do to a basis element, it, uh, again, I'm glossing over some signs, but it's gonna send it to uh, another basis element. So some big linear combination just takes a basis element to a basis element. And it's even sort of obvious which one it goes to. Uh, you just take your diagram and you rotate it. So the long cycle is just thing by like spinning, spinning these pictures around uh, up to some signs. And uh, you know, also W naught is acting really nicely. W naught is just reflecting your diagram. Pick it up and you flip it over. So uh, this basis, like, uh, it's not a permutation representation in general, but it, uh, you know, some of your favorite permutations are acting very nicely, right, in ways that you can understand uh, through pictures, and uh, you don't have to do a lot of arithmetic to understand what's going on. And uh, let's see that this is like genuinely a different basis. I mean, I guess we know that because uh, things are acting nicely, but like, if I uh, so the Plucker, Plucker relations, uh, they're telling you how to uncross your diagrams. So I'm going to think about the case. This is one, two, three, four. So uh, this picture here is telling me to take the one, three minor and the two, four minor. So it looks like this tableau. One, two, three, one, three, two, four. This one is telling me to take the one, four minor and the two, three minor. And this one over here is telling me to take the one, two minor and then the three, four minor. Okay, so you wanna notice that these are not the same basis because uh, the basis given by non-crossing matchings, that's these two things. These are my two pictures 
that are not crossing. Whereas uh, if I look at the corresponding tableau, uh, this tableau, now I wish I had more colors. Uh, this tableau is bad. The first row is nice, but the second row goes four, three. So the tableau, uh, the standard monomial basis would be to take uh, this one and this one. So I have three polynomials here. Uh, each of these polynomials is a product of two Plucker variables, uh, but they satisfy this three-term relation. And so any two of them are going to be a basis. And the web basis is to take these two to be the basis elements and the standard monomial basis to take these two on the outside to be uh, your two basis elements. And then uh, you're either rewriting this one in terms of the other two using like the straightening law on your tableau, or you're rewriting this one in terms of those two using your uh, uncrossing rules. Okay. So that's uh, what's going on here. So let's briefly- uh, I don't Oliver, get I have a quick you. question before yeah, you uh, move on. Yep. Um, I feel like the point when you're trying to understand an SN action, the thing that you should start with are simple transpositions simple reflections first versus these uh, other actions. And I was curious if the, which basis is it easier to see the action of a simple reflection? Um, basically everything is bad in the standard monomial basis. You can't really see the okay. action of anything. Um, it? It's gonna be possible to understand the, so I think the right way to like find the thing that you're, to find the good basis is to think about these guys as Coxeter element and the and W naught. Um, but once you've done that, uh, nice things happen for the simple reflections also. Mm -hmm. So what your simple reflections are doing is you're taking a diagram like this and mm -hmm. you're taking uh, two adjacent things like seven and eight, and you're just like introducing a crossing right. of them. Okay. And, and then then you, uh, then you know how to undo it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And this is okay. like a temporary lieb thing to do. Okay. So it, like the diagrammatics ends up being really nice sort of all the way around, you can understand the action. So it's not gonna be a permutation representation in general. Like when I apply this thing, I'm gonna get two terms popping out, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not so hard to see which ones they are. Right, yeah. right thanks. No, that's a good question. Okay, so let me uh, briefly say like what the three row version of this is, and then we will like take our, take our break. So uh, three row version, I'm gonna take a three by N matrix of distinct indeterminants. And I'm thinking about SL3 invariants in the same way. And again, it's gonna be spanned uh, by products of maximal minors. Now they're three by three minors instead of two by two minors. And so I have that space. And again, I have this torus, I have this uh, torus here and it's acting, uh, scaling the columns, multiplying on the right. And I'm gonna look at this all ones weight space again. So I'm going to look at products of three by three minors, where uh, every column of this matrix is going to show up in exactly one of my three by three minors. So in particular, uh, n had better be a multiple of three for this to make any sense. So when I do this, uh, I got some space of invariant polynomials, some particular white space here. And uh, Again, it carries a symmetric group action. There's a symmetric group also you know, multiplying on the right, permuting these columns around. And that preserves the set of polynomials where I touch every column exactly once, because if I permute the columns, I'm still touching them all exactly once. And uh, I then have some SN module. And again, this is just my spec module. This is like another very concrete realization of the spec module. And Standard monomial theory, again, is gonna tell me how to write down a basis for the space, but I have my spec module as uh, a bunch of polynomials and it's gonna have a basis given by standard Young tableau that are gonna be uh, three row rectangles. So M is the, you know, the number of Plucker variables I'm thinking about. And uh, this is telling me what to do. So here I'm gonna take the, the columns one, three, and five of my matrix there's a three by three minor. I'll take my 
columns two, six, and 10, there's another three by three minor, my four, eight, 11 columns, my seven, nine, 12 columns. I have these four three by three minors. They are uh, disjoint in terms of which columns they think about. Every column shows up in one of them. I mean, apparently n equals 12. Um, and I multiply them together and that's some explicit polynomial and it, it lives in my spec module. And the action of SN is easy to understand in the same way. I'm just taking these numbers and feeding the numbers into the permutation and getting a new tableau, right? Or on the polynomial, I'm just taking my variables, these variables, and I'm just re-indexing them, right? I'm sending uh, xi to x sub wi, and yi goes to y sub wi, and all that. So I'm just getting uh, this very concrete action of the symmetric group on some like very concrete polynomials. You have a question, Leonardo? No. Oh, okay. You, you've made some noise. Okay. So there's uh so again, again, like I have this baseless. Uh, if I hit it with the long cycle, I hit it with the long cycle, like it's a disaster, right? Like or I hit it with basically any permutation, it's a disaster. Like I permute the numbers and I get something that's not a standard tableau, and like I try to unwind it, and like lots of terms appear. Like you can do it, you can compute it by hand, but it takes a while. There's a nice pictorial story in the special case that uh, lets you see what's going on a bit better. And I stuck lots of names on this, but I'm not really sure what to say. This is the basis of SL3 web. So there's these kind of diagrams that look like this. And I'm not gonna tell you like exactly how one does it, but the, every such diagram, there's some like invariant polynomial that you're supposed to write down. You, you look at this graph and this graph is some sort of uh, uh, recipe for feeding determinants into each other and you, you get some big thing and uh, in this basis one way to see this is a nice basis is if i act by the long cycle then instead of getting some like big linear combination of basis elements i just get one thing like maybe some assign attached to it and it's just like what you get by spinning this thing you're just rotating your diagram relabeling things and w naught is doing a really nice thing it's just picking it up and flipping it over this one's symmetric, so you don't always do that. And so like you can uh, you can do this and you, you get like nice combinatorial stuff going on, a nice algebra or it attaches to all sorts of things. Um, it ends up being very useful. And like for a long time, people have been looking for like a good definition of webs in uh, higher ranks. So Cooper Berg, Cooper works like in general tape, but he's only thinking up to rank two. And think about SL3, you can think about some other things, but like, what are you doing with SLK? And people have made definitions and like, they're probably even the right definitions, but they, they don't quite do the things that we want them to do for like our combinatorial purposes. Um, and instead, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, like, we're, we'll take our break uh, here, here, break, break time. Uh, we're going to uh, go back to this pennant story and I'll tell you how to see this pennant story as like some explicit set of polynomials. And uh, there's gonna be something like a web basis there. Like I'm gonna have these, uh, these planar diagrams and every planar diagram is going to like give me some corresponding polynomial that I can work with very explicitly. And a lot of the same things will happen. Okay, so let's stop there for now. <laughs>